not a con. Okay, um, I'm Eldon Goldenberg, and I'm Sean Sujek. We're from a, the Dynamics of Adaptive Behaviour Lab at Case up the road, and we're going to talk about basically what we do for a living. We're, we're both PhD students, and our field is sort of called AI. Um, I prefer to throw qualifiers in, things like biologically inspired AI, but basically we're going to talk about what we do. So, to begin with, I, I should probably address why I'm so uncomfortable with the term AI. So, you know, we have this, this 1960s term, artificial intelligence, that sounds, even before Spielberg made a film about it, it sounded like it should be the title of the Spielberg film. I think it gives people images like this. You know, we, we have our cyborg, this half man, half machine, and, you know, I, I will never get up and say, this is impossible because that's just begging to be proven wrong. But what I will say is that that's a very, very long way from being a practical reality. So just to make the point, we are not talking about androids or cyborgs or you know, making artificial people. Instead, we're talking about things like this, which on one level, I guess, are less glamorous and less exciting. But this, in case you haven't already heard about it, is the Roomba. It's an automatic vacuum cleaner. It, it sounds like it would actually make a passable electronic pet as well. The, the point basically is it drives itself around your floor. You just set it off and it goes up and down the room. And when you come back, you know, it, it has cleaned up your floor. And that's a much more, it's a much more realistic AI innovation. Obviously, there's no way we talk about it being intelligent in the sense of doing you know, human intelligent tasks or having a conversation with your Roomba. If, you know, if, if I get home and I, I find someone having a conversation with a Roomba, I'm going to be pretty disturbed. But it's intelligent in the sense that it's not a machine that just has to be directly controlled. It's, it's much more independent. You can give it a task and let it get on with it. Which, if you think about having a person clean your room, that's, that's what you do. You don't tell them exactly where each bit of dust is. You, you say, clean this room and you leave them to it. Now before I, I let Sean tell you about all the good things we do, it's worth addressing the things that we don't do that still are within the field. And they, they tend to get referred to by the rather disparaging acronym of GoFi, which stands for Good Old Fashioned AI. It's, it's one of those goods that's you know, not really very sincere. Um, and this is what people were doing in the 1960s when they first started using the term. Uh, the few things I like to think of it as are AI through search. The best example would be something like a game of chess. In theory, from every chessboard, you can search through uh, the, the tree of all the possible moves you could make, all the moves your opponent can make in response, keep, keep searching through it like that and figure out, okay, so which of these moves gives my opponent the least good moves to make? Or alternatively, AI through flowchart. Don't read out the details, I just plagiarized that from someone's lecture notes. But it was very much based on this idea that you know you, you do box A and then you can move on to doing box B. And, and this is the nature of intelligent behavior. Um, it's very focused on what I'd call higher mental processes. The, the higher should always be in scare quotes. But to, to give an example that we're going to come back to a few times, they weren't interested in how we walk. Because until you give that serious thought, walking down a room seems like a trivial, obvious problem. They were much more interested in, well, how do we plan chess moves? Or how do we debate philosophy? Um, then this is an example of the Turing test, which was the gold standard for a good old-fashioned AI. The idea was basically that you have a person communicating with an entity that they can't see, so you, you get around issues of, well, it's, it's made of metal, of course it's a machine. They're just communicating by text, so it's, it's almost like you're, you're IMing this other entity, and you have to decide whether it's a person or a machine. 
So a machine that passes the Turing test is one that fools a good proportion of, of human beings into thinking they're actually talking to a fellow human being. And I think that's illustrative of the, the kind of things that GoFi was trying to achieve. And finally, some of you might, might recognize this. Um, bonus points at the end if you can tell me what, what movie Whopper came from. Um, I'm, I'm hoping you all can. <laughs> but uh, the, the point I want to make with this, in line with the Turing test, is that if you look at that, it's a disembodied machine. It's just this, this big lump of electronics um, with, with no thoughts about the importance of the body. Which is why the Turing test had to basically cheat by saying, you know, we're going to communicate on text only. They, they were avoiding all these other problems of what we have. Now, I, I do have a habit of being quite disparaging about all of this, but it was all the product of its context. My, my background originally is in psychology, and I'm, I don't want to turn this into a psychology lecture, but basically it reflected um, the, the psychology that was dominant in the 50s and 60s. And this was revolutionary at the time, because prior to the 1950s, people didn't even, as, as psychologists, look at mental contents. They just looked at behavior. It, it's all the famous rat and maze type experiments. And what happened in the 50s and 60s is there was what they called the cognitive revolution. People finally said, well, how can you have a science of the mind that doesn't actually study the mind? And, and they started looking at trying to understand what a, a thought process is. The, the problem was that this is you know, the most complicated thing we can look at in ourselves. So what they started doing was, at least looking at modern terms, pretty naive. It was basically psychology through flowchart. This, as it happens, is a recent example. And it's, it's a little cruel. A, a, a friend sent me this from his PhD advisor's um, published work. But the key point is that when you start trying to make a flowchart of any sort of thought process, you get things like this. We have a box. I don't know if you can read it from the back, but it just says process seven with nothing about what process seven is. And what basically ends up happening is character in this. You know, there's, there's all these gaps and they don't really cover anything. And that basically set up GoFi to have its problems because all of the gaps in the models become things that your AI can't do. But before I leave it all together, I should acknowledge that you know, there are things this did well. And a point I really want to stress is that I'm not trying to argue that GoFi is a waste of time and should be thrown out. It, it tries to accomplish completely different things from, from modern biological AI. So one example would be medical expert systems. I don't know how widely these are actually used, but they're the, the textbook example in academia. Basically, the doctor has a script that says, ask questions X, Y, and Z. And based on the answer to the first question, that's entered into, into a computer, which goes through a decision tree and says, OK, this, this person's running a fever. That cuts out half of the things I might have wrong with it. Narrow down to this half. And within that environment, it works pretty well, because there's, there's a human interacting with it um, who, who has that expertise. And the domain is relatively limited. Although there are unlimited things you could have wrong with you, there's a finite set of diagnoses the doctor can give you, treatments the doctor can recommend. So it can all be covered. And the one practical example I know is that in Britain, the, the National Health Service has this, this website called NHS Direct, which you can go to and it will, will basically say, oh, you're sneezing, but you're not running a fever. You have a cold, don't waste your doctor's time. But, but what you see in terms of limitations is that actually it very often says, this may be important, go and see a doctor. So it still has to defer to, to humans with experience for anything serious. The next one is theorem improving. Um, theorem improving is something I got very tired of last year because I, I had to go through the computer science PhD qualifiers. Um, the point is that it's, actually, it's a human behavior that actually does operate by applying simple rules. Or, although they may not seem obvious to you know, the grad student studying for calls. There, there are rules that underlie it all, and you can codify those rules. So GoFi was pretty successful with that. The paperclip, 
Um, I'm, I'm expecting to get hassled for this, basically. But that paperclip that drives most tech-savvy users of Microsoft products insane is actually really useful to you know, my grandma, who's a bit afraid of computers and doesn't really know what she's doing, but, but wants to. The way that works is um, what I'd call old-fashioned AI. It, it looks for specific set things. So, you know, if, if you have deer and a name, and then a comma and a new line, it, says, it looks like you're trying to type a letter. But at the same time as saying this is useful and a success, one of the reasons why it is so irritating is that it's extremely unsophisticated. So it, it doesn't have any way of responding to, um, OK, this user always sends me away. I'm not going to pop up and bother them anymore. Or this user looks like they're writing a letter when actually they're doing task X instead. I'll, I'll change my response. And finally, to, to game players. Um, I used chess as an example before because it's probably the most high profile success of GoFi. Um, I don't know if you recognize the thing, but you probably recognize the name. This was IBM's computer chess player. This did work more or less as I caricatured in terms of searching the space of possible games. And the problem is this in the late 90s, and it's a thing that took eight years of development and weighs 1.4 tons, because even for the game of chess, it had such a gigantic space of things it had to be able to examine. So it had to have huge amounts of memory, huge amounts of storage, um, and utterly state-of-the-art uh, processors, many of them running in parallel, to be able to compete with a human being who just has what's in here, and obviously can't proceed by, by expanding all the possible moves. Um, by, by contrast, something like Go, um, we, we don't yet have a good computer player for because the space of moves is just that much bigger. And I'd say the, the biggest problems that GoFi has are in dealing with the real world. You know, chess is, chess is great if you want to work with GoFi because it's constrained. However big the space looks like to, to me as a not very good chess player, it's, it's still limited. There are only certain moves each piece can make and, and there are set ways the game ends. Where, where GoFi really fails is if you have things that have to have some kind of physical instantiation. So these two are um, a robot called Shaky, because that describes how it moves, um, and a, a computer program called Shirdlu, which apparently just came from someone hitting keys on, um, on a keyboard. They, they were both supposed to be demonstrations of how you could communicate in natural language with, with an artificial system and it would go and do your thing. So, so you would say to Shaky, um, walk across the room. And Shaky would go, and you know, Shaky will, I shouldn't go down, I'll get feedback. Um, Shaky will walk across the room. And Shaky wouldn't have realized that it would get feedback, so Shaky would have carried on. Um, <laughs> or, or you say to Shirdlu, pick up the red block. And Shirdlu moves along its arm. It's, it's like one of those things in fairgrounds that you try and win the cuddly toy to impress someone with. Um, so it'll move along and it'll drop its hand down and pick up the red block. But they're incredibly restricted in terms of what they can do. Shirdly only exists in a world that actually resembles this. It, it couldn't adapt to this table and say, pick up the pen. Um, and Shaky, for one thing, it has wheels. So a single step will defeat this robot. For another, it's got really limited vision. Now, if you look at the picture, and you'll see this on any picture of a 1960s robot. It's got white walls, white floor, no features. If you put Shaky in this room, it wouldn't be able to cope because the carpet has a pattern, and the walls have features, and there are things moving around out of its control. And that would be enough to, to stop the thing from coping. So I think the point I'm trying to make is that GoFi has been very useful in restricted controlled domains, but it, it can't cope at all with the real world and with simple things like an instruction to walk across a room that seem trivial to us. Now, I'll, I'll hand over to Sean to paint something more positive about what we actually do and what works in our, our world. <laughs> 
All right, so Elden has just pointed out that GoFi basically 